the more that we actually learn about the world we're in, the greater the mysteries. One in 50 American adults had experiences that could point to abduction. It's extremely brave for someone to make their story public in this arena. We'd look away and the ship would light up and the next thing is just boom, it's gone. Men and women have been taken for purposes of reproduction and hybridization. I was abducted. I wake up and there's such a bright light. They would tell me to look in their eyes. They're controlling your thoughts. Inserting this gigantic tube inside of my body, it's painful. I'm now looking who this man is. He is inside of me. It's a screen image of the reptilian. They began the insemination process. A new embryo is created, and that little hybridized embryo already formed is implanted in the womb, and she will gestate. They always want the children fetuses. I would go in for my appointment and there would just be no baby. With a very long needle through the belly button, we'd go into the uterus and they would find the fetus. It holds on to the fetus and pulls out. And then they bring this little girl in the room. And he said that she's yours. This beautiful eyes, this face, and I see myself in the child. She was emanating her feelings. I was shocked. It was nobody's right to impregnate me and use me as a laboratory rat. I went from 210 pounds to 115 pounds. These beings that are doing the abducting don't have the same morality as we do. They don't think what they're doing is wrong. Hearing other people's accounts will make you go, OK, I'm not crazy. I'm not alone. Who are we serving? We need to ask those questions. Look, human beings taken animals in the wild and bred them. Can we be bred into something different? The answer is absolutely, of course we can. Educate yourself, be open-minded. Don't be dismissive. People have been taken. You can't ignore this anymore. Make up your own mind. Don't let anyone ever tell you how you think. Sorry guys, not all DTs are good. Welcome to The Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Greetings. My guests, plural, for this program are John Sumpel and Jack Roth. John and Jack are uh, two of the partners in what's called J3 Films. They have produced a new documentary on the phenomenon of alien abduction and just alien encounters in general, which is called Extraordinary The Seeding. Spoiler alert and disclaimer, I am in this documentary. I was shot for it and uh, just recently saw it. And um, we're now here to, to talk about this really quite extraordinary film, if I may say. So let me please greet you both. John Sumpel and Jack Roth, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> both at the same time, please. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so... so um, Anyway, I'm, I'm very glad to have both of you on. We have met in person and uh, from my part, working with you both when we did shoot, uh, gosh, middle of early part of 2018, I guess. It was a very positive experience. I remember enjoying it quite a bit. And we had a lot of good conversation on the side. But can one of you just jump in and talk about this film? It is, there are other treatments of alien abduction phenomenon that are out there. Um, but I really do want to say there's something special about this documentary and maybe it's the heart. And by that, I just mean this is a, a film that does, while it does deal with some of the technological elements of uh, what we believe is alien abduction, there's a lot more here. And it it's a film that actually reaches deep down in ways that I didn't expect before I saw it. So can one of you just speak about this a little bit? Jack, do you want to start off and I can fill in the blanks or either way, yeah, it doesn't work. That yeah, either way. Why, why don't you, John, talk about this? Because you're you, you, you have this. Uh, you, I think you say it well. OK, um, for me, uh, what was interesting with this film is that we in any documentary film, you have an idea of what you want to do when you first go into it. And, and we had this kind of structure that we wanted to focus on. And it was more about the abduction uh, and missing pregnancy phenomena. Uh, 
But what we found out through the interviews, and in particularly one uh, with uh, Melinda Leslie, is that she really got down to the heart of what wound up being the, the, the essence of the film, which was compassion. And, and having compassion for people uh, who have had these experiences. So the film really took on a different light uh, as a result of that conversation with her. It just was like a ringing bell moment that there's an opportunity to uh, help people better understand that people who have had experiences are people too. Uh, and it really took on a, comp- a, a, a different light. I'll just add that I was blown away by Melinda Leslie in this documentary. Uh, she Now, you had a lot of interesting people that you interviewed here. So you had Yvonne Smith, who's a hypnotherapist uh, dealing with abduction phenomena. You had Barbara Lamb, uh, who similarly has done a lot of hypnotherapy for people who've had abduction experiences. Um, and you had a lot of other individuals who were uh, abductees, experiencers, most of whom I, I hadn't seen before. Uh, oh, you did have Alejandro Rojas, who I thought was very good on point. Um, and Mark D'Antonio, you had myself. So there was a lot of that information, but Melinda came in and Melinda Leslie, uh, for those folks who've known her, I've known her for about 15 years, is herself an experiencer and a researcher. She is both and I just have to say the passion, uh, the kind of focused, on point, excellent um, message that she had was one of the high points of the of the documentary for me. And and I think it, it impacted all of us as well. Yeah. You know, we talked about it after that, after we were done with our interview, how powerful it was. Yeah. I mean, were, I think there was even a couple of tears uh, on our crew as she was sharing some of the, the, her personal experiences, as well as uh, why are we why are we not as compassionate for people who've gone through something that is extremely uh, challenging and difficult yeah. to wrap your brain around, um, but yet we're there for other people in, in other dire situations. So it just was a very powerful moment uh, in the interview that uh, resonated in the film and became a, a, a big part of the film. I mean, if I just may add, she was, uh, on the one hand, talking about how people who've had these experiences are so marginalized and feel so alone in society. But but at the same time, she was really, I think, giving a call for, for strength from those people and uh, mm-hmm. really was quite inspiring, very inspiring with what yeah. she had to say. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. So what can we, what's about the missing, uh, missing embryo, missing fetus syndrome? That was a big part of this. Is this something that you guys are able to talk about here? Sure. Uh, I'll start this one off, I guess. Uh, you know, in the research that we've done over the last couple of years, uh, we've spoken to a lot of women who have become pregnant. And then within the first trimester, uh, all of a sudden will go to an appointment, uh, with their doctor. And then all of a sudden, uh, overnight, uh, the, 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 the fetus is gone. Um, right. and in some cases, you know, women know their bodies and they talk about how I'm telling you that it was there one second and not the next. Um, and a lot of, and, and some of them, uh, also remember having, strange experiences, uh, abduction experiences that the night before, the week before. Um, so that ties into that phenomena. And we, we, we heard this story from not one, not two, but several women. Um, and that piqued our interest. And when John and I were talking about this film, we're like, you know, that has to be a part. It's part of the, it's part of what's going on here. Um, it ties into, uh, trying to, gain a better understanding of what the phenomena is it's 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 about being abducted but it's also what happens after the abduction because there are actually several abductions and there and there's a process to uh whatever these ets are doing there's a process to it so that's that's what that was all about it was an absolutely fascinating part of it and i wonder if we can stay on this a little bit because it's such a dramatic uh, event. I mean, a woman who's pregnant suddenly is missing, is n- not pregnant any longer. And the medical establishment does have prosaic explanations for this, of course. But um, but in this in this treatment of yours, I think you, you guys make it clear that 
that doesn't necessarily seem very persuasive. I mean, these people are having uh, apparent, pretty clear abduction experiences in connection with this that they often explicitly remember, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we one of the things, too, that came out, uh, we screened uh, probably 20 different people before we decided on who we were going to have on the, on the film. And several of the people that we screened said, I'd, I would love to share my story, but I can't. And they were profound stories. And some of them were because it would have an impact on my family. It could ruin my career. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, these things happen to me. I know they happen to me, but I can't talk about it. So that, that was a big compelling part for us as, as we heard that. And then when we talked to the people like Barbara and Yvonne and they say, this is not, this is not an uncommon phenomena. This is a very common phenomena. So, you know, as we talk more and more about it and, you know, can we prove any of this, you know, definitively? No, but when you're talking to somebody uh, face-to-face or when we did some of the screening phone calls and they break down and they're sharing an emotional story and, and it, you can't discount that. You can't discount that what I experienced was, was real to me. So that's the, a big part of the film too is having that level of uh, uh, desire to listen to those stories and, and one and two, have some compassion towards them. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it didn't happen. So unless and then there's a great line from um, um, one of the people in the film that is uh, unless it happens to you it's just a story. Susan Bedell I think says that in the film, and 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 it's true. It, it, that is a very important part of this. You know, if you don't have your own story to share, you can't relate to it. That doesn't mean you need to, you know, discount that person's emotional experience specifically. And the thing is, the medical establishment, you know, they I get the feeling like they just do not want to hear this possibility that there are other beings that are at least in some cases are responsible for this missing fetus syndrome. And but the thing is, although we're not at the point where I suppose we're able to prove it uh, scientifically or medically, there is a a shockingly high number of, of individuals who believe that this is what has happened to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like with other elements of the UFO phenomenon, it's like how much testimony, how many witnesses do you want to just throw out their, throw out their observations and just pretend that they're not having these observations? Right. And it is, it's the same with the missing, um, missing embryo, missing fetus. D- were you able, I don't remember this, were there any, did you run into medical professionals who you asked about this? Did they offer opinions? Were any of them open? I wonder to the no, likelihood we, that this is. We, we reached out to a half a dozen different physicians. And once they knew what, what we wanted to talk about, right. it, there was either no interest. Uh, there was one who we got pretty close to going on the record that eventually declined. And the big reason why is that it changes their professional arc if they start talking about this. So that was one right. of the things that was a challenge. I know some people who watch this, if they're, they're they, we need proof. Where's the proof? Talk to the scientists. We tried, you know, we couldn't find somebody who was yeah. willing to go on the record. They go running. I, I've often found just in my private uh, life, I'll get uh, emails and communications from retired professors or retired scientists and, and people who are no longer worried about their career. And then they'll say, oh, yes, very interested in your work. <laughs> so that that's how right, it, right. that's how it often will go, and I suspect it's similar with with this. But nonetheless, there are some off the record conversations too. That you know, with, with there was one physician in particular in California that uh, didn't definitively answer things, but his willingness to do the, do the interview initially, and then he eventually turned turned away. Um, and as we had those conversations on the phone, he says, "I have I I have I've experienced this phenomena." So it feels like mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, th- we have something, but we really can't talk about it. You know, tried really hard over the course of about six weeks to get him to agree to, to be interviewed. And ultimately yeah. it didn't happen. But Too bad. Yeah, it, yeah, it's unfortunate. But hopefully we'll find we – were, there was one physician in particular that we were hoping to connect to who was willing to talk about this stuff 20 years ago. And uh, I just don't know where he is. We couldn't find him. And we were trying to track him down through several resources and, and just couldn't find him. So – yeah, we tried in earnest to tr- to get that side of the story. We just couldn't find somebody willing to go on the record. 
Well, uh, the seating or extraordinary, the seating, the name of your film deals with more than than missing fetuses. Although that is definitely a part of it because it's it's evidently part of the hybridization program. I would say in general, you're dealing with a lot of trauma of these experiencers, and they are really the heart of this film. Uh, you had one gentleman who lost a tremendous amount of weight, apparently due to the trauma, just because of what he was experiencing. And other people um, who just similarly um, taken into a, a very, very difficult uh, emotional state that they, I think they just feel trapped with, with what they're dealing with. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things that and I know a lot of people are guilty of, I know I am, is that we tend to focus on the phenomena. Mm -hmm. So we want to know what is a UFO? What is it made of? Who's piloting the craft? Who are these ETs? Who are, you know, where do they come from? And then we, you know, a lot, a lot of times we like to delve into the science of that, whether it's, you know, physics, quantum physics, how they get here. Um, but as storytellers, and John and I have talked about this at length, our, we feel like it's our, our job to tell, talk about people's journeys and to talk about people's experiences and the profound impact that these experiences have on them. Uh, John made a great point. Can we prove any of this definitively? And the answer right now, at least, is no. Maybe one day we will. Um, but we can corroborate evidence and we can talk to these people. But the one thing that always comes through loud and clear is that it is having a profound impact on them. And when you do have when you talk to someone face to face and you see it in their eyes and there's despair and sadness and just sadness and fear mm -hmm. and they start crying and they they these experiences are affecting their lives in a serious way and i think as human beings we need to tap into that we need to say look we don't know exactly what these ufos are we don't know what's what exactly mm -hmm. is going on we're trying to put the pieces of a very big jigsaw puzzle together but one thing we do know is that there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands, if not more people on this planet who are having experience associated with this phenomena. And that's, I think, one of the most important messages we can, we can tell, we can send. Yeah, and it, you also make it very clear that abductions are still happening. A lot of times um, I'll hear someone make a comment, well, why, are there, why aren't there any more abductions being reported? And I just keep thinking, I'm sure they are. And, you know, there are, here's, here's your, your film. You've got a lot of individuals. I've never seen them before. I think they're, they must be um, out for the first time. And I think in many cases, and they're talking about, and these are men, these are women um, who have had these experiences and they're ongoing. And I, what's, what's, I think is the saddest thing about it is the sense of, um, of hopelessness that some of them have at times felt. I mean, not always, but it's it's always lurking there. Like, will this ever end? How do I stop this? And mm -hmm. um, it's it is it, it's heartrending. But it's, yeah, when a couple of the interviews that we did when we were talking to uh, the individuals, you so you see this roller coaster that they're on. There's strength in one moment, and then you know five minutes later. There's this, you know, sadness. There's, right. the, the, as Jack mentioned, the despair, and then there's, there's, the, the, they'll, they'll try to t turn it around into some sort of a hopeful thing. But the one thing that we 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 have seen from the different people that we've, you know, interviewed and in trying to uh, determine who we're going to work with on on, on the, the films that we've done and, and the people that we've spoken with, is the is a level of confusion. They're like, I, I don't quite understand what why it's happening to me, why I was chosen, why it's still happening, what I'm supposed what's supposed to happen. It's just so then there there could be moments of strength where they figure it out. One of the people in particular that we spoke with said that, you know, I, I have a feeling that I know why this is happening. And then the next time, you know, we, we had the conversation, the, the response was, this is this, I just don't understand what's happening. Wow. So that that seeing that yo-yo, seeing that, you know, the highs and the lows, and it, I think part of it, too, for us is we've spent 
quality time with the individuals that we've talked to to see that level. When you see only a few minutes of somebody in a film, you're not seeing the full scope and you're making judgments based on what you might see in a film. But my my challenge to some of these people is spend a day, spend a, you know, a weekend, spend a week with some of these people to really let them talk and share their story and see how you walk away. Mm-hmm. Right? You will walk away change for sure. There's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, they're experiencing this. These are so deeply felt. I wonder if uh, if either or both of you are able to walk listeners through maybe one of the typical uh, experiences that w- these these people have been having. In other words, what is the nature of some of these contacts that some of these people have had? I think the film brings brings them out very well, and I just wonder if you can share some of this for listeners so they can get a sense of you know, who are these other beings? What are they doing? Uh, is is there an agenda that you were able uh, to identify when you were, you know, doing your own research into this? Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. John, I, I can start this off and then you can... Sure. Go ahead. Um, well, yeah, I think that it typically uh, what we found is that as far as agendas go, we're going to be talking about that more in the third film. Um, but as far as, uh, what typically happens, uh, you have a person, uh, uh, who is somehow abducted, uh, and it usually comes in the form of they'll be sleeping one night or they'll be driving and they'll have missing time, or they'll have this very strange experience that they can't quite remember. Um, if, if they can remember anything at all, they remember bits and pieces and what winds up happening is they're they're abducted and what's critical is and what we have found is when they're abducted there's experiments taking place mm-hmm. and these experiments tend to be related to reproductive organs uh so in other words for females they will they are being examined their uh their reproductive organs are either being examined or in certain cases harvested if you will Mm -hmm. and the same for men uh same exact thing for men so what what winds up and some people start remembering little things like well i was on a craft i remember being on a craft but i also remember being on a craft with 10 other people men and women at the same time so then okay so then you, you put you bring that element into it and then what winds up happening is a, a, for women all of a sudden they they might be pregnant um, and and they, they realize they're pregnant and in many cases they maybe they've been trying to get pregnant with their spouse for quite a long time they've had miscarriages uh, and then all of a sudden now they're pregnant mm. um, and then we talked about the missing fetuses. So after a certain amount of time, all of a sudden, seemingly overnight, the fetus disappears. They're no longer pregnant. And for the men, it's a little different because they, they're they not hosting the fetus. So the, for the men, they just, they're having these abduction experience. Sperm, in a lot of cases, is be, you know, their sperm is being extracted. And sometimes they remember being forced to actually have sexual intercourse with either other people, other humans who were on the craft, and sometimes these stranger looking hybrid beings. And what winds up, the result is usually sometime later, in many cases, they are again abducted and somehow introduced to these children. And these children, they're told by these ETs that this is your child. Uh, and 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 they almost in a way we've heard this a lot too that they want the parent to love the child to show affection to in one case in the film you heard uh, uh, one of our uh, interviewees say I mother the child that they wanted the, mm-hmm. the the ET wanted her to mother the child to to give affection um, and there's a you want to talk about a profound emotional impact that's where it really gets intense because. As a human beings, we care for our children instinctually. So when we see these children, we see and we understand that they're part of us. But there's also they might be a little strange looking. They're kind, they're part of us, but they're not all of us. And so this is this is kind of what we the pattern that's that we've seen the developed with all of our the people we've interviewed. So 
that, and I hope that answers the question, but I think that's kind of the process that we're dealing with. Now, as far as agenda, we're going to get more into that in the third film, as far as maybe, you know, po- perhaps some end game possibilities. Uh, but as far as the process itself, that's what we've seen. Well, thank you for that, Jack. And in fact, the process that that you just described, and that is really well told in the film, is uh, it's honestly it's classic abduction scenario that researchers have been uh, honing in on now for many years. I mean, Bud Hopkins back in the 1980s was looking at this, and other researchers as well. This idea that um, what we're dealing with is a reproductive agenda. So I think it's interesting that that you guys in your film here have, you know, it's not like you were, I, I assume you were not intentionally trying to follow up on that element of abduction research, but when you found these experiencers, these abductees, this is exactly what you guys also found. It's quite interesting. Yeah, the first time we heard one of these stories, uh, it was from Sierra, uh, in, and she's in the film, Sierra Nablina, she's in yes. the film. Mm-hmm. And we heard this story nine, ten years ago. And uh, that was kind of, I remember the, the night we were talking, whether we, when we were done with the conversation, Jack and I looked at each other and said, is this really happening? And is it happening to a lot of people? Is it is is this is her story unusual? So then, as we started doing research, we started finding out more and more that this is not only uh, common, <laughs> that it happens quite often. And we were shocked as we as we started to do some research into it and seeing that there were, uh, there's been other documented cases of things like this that have been reported. Talking to different people at MUFON who said numerous cases reported of missing pregnancies. It's, so it's extraordinary. We were onto yeah. something there, and there was a different story. It was a different angle. And what you find, like I've known a couple of the people in that documentary. Um, you guys, of course, got to know them all fairly well. And I'm going to guess, you know, upon reflection, you thought all of these people seem quite believable. They seem very sane as well. Uh, they seem very psychologically stable, at least. Uh, they've been through trauma, but am I right in assuming you've you've assumed that you know they're definitely on the level? I mean, this is this yeah. is honest and true. And that was important. That was really important for us. Is two things was to find people who would come across as extremely credible human beings that other human beings could relate to. They might not be able to relate to the phenomena, but they can relate to pain, anguish, frustration, confusion, and we can all relate to those at at some level. So that was really important to get that we're all in this together, the highs and lows of life type of thing, so that that resonates with everybody. Uh, But the other thing, too, is to find people who were new, who who hadn't really come out and told their stories and the and they weren't doing the the the, the circuit of uh, ufology uh, uh, events, so that people could see one that these are high quality people and two these are names that we're really not familiar with, so it, that was very important that that we we present a, something different something that hadn't been seen before in a, a UFO film or television show. Everyone you had in there, I thought, was compelling. Like there was not one. Mm-hmm witness you had in there that I thought um, didn't really have a riveting story. So that was actually quite nice, uh, at least from a viewer's point of view, not not nice for them. Uh, One thing that came out, actually, I know implants were part of this. And and then the other thing that was actually a a fairly significant theme, as, as I'm recalling, is that this idea of creating hybrids and breeding like basically a new form of of a human being i mean how much of this figured into the film this idea of hybridization um well i think i think it, it was a big part of what we wanted in this film i think when we were after we were finished with our first film we kind of ended that with the introduction of these hybrid children and that and I remember, John, we talked about this and I said to you, this is what this is all about. This is, if not the most important aspect of all this, one of the most important aspects, because this seems to be what their purpose is, why the why of it all. 
right? We know the what, we know the when, we, we, we kind of think we know the who, but why? So when we're, when we're looking into these things, it's, it's the end product always seems to be these hybrid children. And this hybrid, you can, the conjecture there, and, and, and as, as researchers, as journalists, as filmmakers, as documentarians, we throw theories around. Um, and we do it amongst ourselves and we talk about, well, why Who are, is this a new, is this, it, it, are these, is this a new form of human life? Is this the next step in our evolution? Um, and how are these ETs controlling this? And are they the ones that are going to determine what the next step in our evolution is, or have they already done it before? Is this just a continuation of it? It's something that may have started 10,000 years ago. So it's all conjecture, but yeah, the, the, I think the hybridization part of it, because there's two aspects to it. There's a fascinating intellectual aspect to this. And when you start thinking about hybrid races and creating hybrid ET human hybrid races, I mean, there's, there's few things I can find. I can see that are more fascinating than that, but there's also a really strong emotional element to it because we're talking about children. We're talking about creating children and these children we've learned and experienced have emotions. They have wants and needs and desires. Mm -hmm. So, so who are these people? Who are these kids? And can, can we someday communicate with them on a more regular basis? That's my hope, but that's getting into another conversation. Well, I want <laughs> if I can ask, if I can ask either of you, um, because I can't recall actually um, if you treated this in the film or not, but where uh, did you have any ideas where these hybrid children are? So are they on a big mothership above circling above us or are they integrated within our society? And I, I'm, I'm trying to give myself, because I know what, what some researchers, different researchers have different opinions on this, but increasingly, you know, I'm getting like, there's folks like David Jacobs, but also Barbara Lamb, um, from my recollection, have talked about the integration of hybrids into society. And I think each of them has their own take on that. Did you guys have a conclusion on this? Are these hybrids being inserted into human society or are they being kept separate? Did you get a sense of that? Yeah. That's in your wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, there's a couple answers to that, actually. I think, yes, I think both mm -hmm. um, from what we've learned. And again, we are not uh, certainly not experts. I don't know if anyone could be an expert on this particular subject matter. But from what we've heard and experienced, uh, we, we've heard that it's both, that there are there, there, there might be more than one hybridization program. So you're getting into all these different, so if there are more than one and there's different species involved and there's different ET races involved, then some may be doing this to, again, uh, to take, to, to have these children uh, blend into our society. You know, today we, we talk all about indigo children and these really gifted children, this new generation of kids that's so intelligent and so intuitive. Uh, and there's been books, many books written on indigo children. Well, who are these indigo? Why? Why is this happening now? So there's that aspect of it. But yes, we also have heard from many people that in certain in certain abduction scenarios and hybridization scenarios that these children are kept off planet and they're kept off planet because there's no way they could survive on this planet, at least not yet. Yeah. And that's those are the kinds of things you hear. So uh, from that, it, it, to answer your question, really, it, we've heard both. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so um, the witnesses you had, or I guess the experiencers that you had on here, they had some very, very dramatic stories. And uh, I can't remember the names of m most of them, unfortunately. But I do recall that you had a, a, a man gentleman who was so dealing with such a, a deep level of trauma that it, it really just, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about him. And this is a gentleman who talked about having lost so much weight as a result of the stress, the stress alone of his experiences. Is it possible that we can talk a little bit about his story? 
Yeah, I, uh, his story was one that is a little bit of an outlier to the other ones, but there was a reason why we kept his uh, story in there. One, because of the 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 depth of what he was able to share with us was was pretty profound. It was an emotional story that was important too. Uh, very precise details was another big part of uh, his story. But most of the stories, and, and we've had some people ask, well, why were there not more male, you know, people included in, in the storytelling? And uh, to, in all honesty is that the most profound stories that we heard were from from women. And and we think that the, and, and part of our objective is to get this film out to the largest audience possible. And we think that telling an emotional story will resonate with both men and women. And we'll 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 get more eyeballs on this for the sole purpose of having it move from the fringes into the uh, into the into the central conversation. So that's ultimately one of our goals as we make films. But with uh, Rob Fullington, is Robert Fullington is his name, and and his story is very different because it's not it's it's still reproduction, it's still hybridization, but it's not hybridization in the way that we would uh, uh, term it in a classic case that, that we talked about earlier. Yeah, you know, we have a tendency to think of uh, uh, you know the sexual reproduction in just the the human way that we're familiar with sexual intercourse. But there's other ways that are done, numerous different ways through the different experts that we've talked to. It's not just about that. It's It can be a, in a variety of different ways that it's accomplished. Rob's situation was very unique because his was about shared consciousness. He was being abducted and his consciousness was being basically removed from his body and implanted elsewhere, implanted in these clones as he, he he was taken on a tour of this facility where he saw all of this. And then the more and more he saw, the more and more frightened he got to the point where he said, I'm done. Get me out of here. I don't want to be a part of this. But it was about shared consciousness. So that is, you know, in his story, it was about these clones are being made of, of grays. I don't remember if they were tall. Jack, do you remember if they were tall grays or if there was a specific race? I think it was tall grays. Um, and they were be, they were being cloned, and they were using human consciousness to basically energize and motorize and and and, and use these uh, uh, beings. And as Rob says, for God knows what he said, like I still don't know. But he's very long, deep story, which we will probably have is like a feature featurette type of thing in the future that goes into his story a little bit more deeply. Yeah, this this is why I asked about him. Now I'm remembering because. Uh, even if you go back 20 plus years, there was an abduction researcher named Carla Turner who had some cases that actually were somewhat similar to that, to the consciousness, basically the removal of consciousness into, into another being. So it actually, it's interesting to me. And um, he was quite interesting. You had another, you had a, a woman in there who was grayed out or blacked out and her uh, voice was altered, as I recall. And... Um, she obviously needed a lot of uh, anonymity, but I recall her story being quite interesting as well. Is it possible to uh, recount any of that? Uh, hers is amazing, John, yeah. right? I mean, the, the, yeah. the, we, we actually considered doing an entire documentary on that because her entire town, there was a UFO flap. Uh, and when was it, John, in the 80s? Mid or 90s, mid 90s. Mid -90s. Uh, and it, in a small town in uh, Missouri, am I getting that yeah. correct? Yeah, um, southwestern Missouri. Southwestern Missouri, where there were hundreds of UFO sightings, abductions, uh, and you're talking about a very a midwestern small town. People were uh, either uh, very religious, uh, one way or the other, whether they were Christian uh, or uh, I believe weren't there Mennonites there too, John, as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there were, there were several. So you had all these people, there were so many, uh, you, everything tied into it, cryptozoology, interdimensional beings, but there was this major flap. And so she was one of the people who experienced this and she, because there's still so much that, again, this is a small town, fairly small town in today's terms. And she, that's why she had to be, she wanted anonymity because it was so difficult for her. She, she yeah. still doesn't want anyone to know. Although, and this is very interesting, they still have support groups in that town where dozens of people show up to talk about the experiences they had back in the mid nineties. Incredible. Yeah. These are group witness, group 
group witness events, uh, uh, government vehicles coming into town, uh, just uh, unbelievable. It does make for a very interesting story and something that we're seriously considering for a future film as well. Uh, the, the big thing with that that we talk with her about is in order for us to tell the story and if, if, if we can get other people to corroborate what she has shared, that makes it compelling. But they have to be willing to go on the record. We can't do an entire documentary film of people disguised. So, And I told her, I said, that if, if, if you were one person telling this story, you are in the spotlight. I said, but if you're surrounded by 30, 50, 60 other people who are willing to talk you're protected. And she's like, no, I agree with that. It's more a matter of finding out who else would be interested in sharing, you know, the similar, the similar stories. But yeah, hers was profound because of uh, her experience being religious, confused her to the nth degree of how is this possible? Why would she be uh, impregnated? Why would she have a child taken away from her? Why would she be shown the child later and not ever be able to see the child? I mean, a s- very, detailed descriptions uh, from her about what her experience was and her a lot of confusion and in uh, uh, anguish for her a lot of emotional absolutely and i would just if there's any physicians listening who are thinking oh this is a lot of nonsense this is simply um missing fetus syndrome i would really encourage them to look at least somewhat into uh, this documentary and into the stories of so many other people who have had what surely does appear to be alien abduction experiences. Uh, doctors dismiss this because they just think the whole alien factor is non-existent, so therefore it can't be what people are saying. But I would encourage doctors to look a little differently at this. Uh, the evidence is disturbing, and when you first throw yourself into this, it it's a place that you don't want to go. And I I know full well because I didn't want to go there 25 years ago when I started down that road, but it is what it is. And when you start looking at this evidence, you realize there is a lot of it. And these people are all so incredibly consistent that it becomes very difficult to dismiss. And that's just another of your witnesses. And you had another one who was a, a younger woman uh, with dark hair. She had multiple experiences. She was very, very clear, very articulate about her experiences as well. And I wonder if one of you can describe her her story. Her story is kind of fascinating because of uh, the, the the kind of the path that she was on as 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 a as a person. She was a a, 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 a mute. I think she was in the San Jose. Uh, uh, junior symphony as a, uh, a violinist. I think it was a violin. Yeah. Violinist. And she was extremely intelligent school, uh, successful career, six figure type of scenario on an upward arc. She had in 2013, an abduction experience that was riveting to her. And she tells it in great detail has drawn p- pictures of it has a ton of of uh, like tactile things that she remembers very very clearly so that kind of shook her to the core to the point where she was didn't know what to say didn't know who to talk to didn't even want to tell her immediate family let alone her extended family she just started a relationship with somebody shortly after that uh, long story short three years later she's still having experiences she decides that she needs to go and see a uh, regression uh therapist so that she can try to figure out what's going on. She learns about abductions that go back all the way when she was five, six, seven years old, where they monitored her, implanted her so that they could monitor her. And then several things that happened to her when she was in her childbearing, uh, of childbearing age, where she was producing uh, ova. So she said there was tons of things that came out of that. So she had one regression, I think it was in January, she went to her, her fiance and, and ended the relationship after that. And then the second regression she had a few months later and profound information about metaphysical uh, realities and, and downloads that she received to the point where she stepped aside from her career and said, I need to focus my efforts on helping other people who have gone through similar things that I've gone through. So to me, when I hear a story like that, I, it forces me to step back and think really hard about why would somebody be willing to do that up just basically turn their life upside down 
because of something that she dreamt. <laughs> you know, really. I mean, the profound experience to her was that it moved me to change my life drastically to help people better understand what's going on. Yeah, it was extraordinary to hear her, actually, because the um, her recalled memories were quite vivid and quite detailed and I would say quite believable. But what was really powerful was the force of her convictions when she mm -hmm. would get into kind of her philosophical approach to what was actually happening. And I just thought, wow, like this is someone who it's almost like a conversion experience, frankly, oh, it was. what really happened sure. with her. Uh, and I think with the other other witnesses and experiences as well, but with her, it seemed quite powerful. And, um, you know, when you run into someone who has the, the force of their convictions, it's it's sort of compelling and it's sort of scary because you think, wow, you really have strong beliefs. But it's also testimony to the, the force of what they have experienced, I guess. It's not mm -hmm. something I can personally relate to. I haven't had that happen to me, but certainly there have been a lot of folks out there who have had detailed encounters that they can then recall and they have a very powerful effect on them. And that obviously was the case with this particular individual. And she recalled having um, multiple hybrid children and uh, all of this came out through, I guess, uh, regression. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one of the things that was interesting with her, too, is uh, I remember when we started the interview with her, this is Geraldine Orozco, and when we were, we were talking with her initially, she seemed so calm. She, Jack, do you remember that it, we were kind of like, is, is, is she like, it, it would not, not, I don't want to say it, that it was robotic, but she was just so calm and very, I mean, philosophical to the point when we took our first break, we were looking at each other going like, what have we stumbled on here? Because some of the things she was talking about were so profound that they were, we couldn't even put it in this film because it just seemed like a higher level thinking that again, it's a separate story. It's a whole different, it's the, it's the matrix universe and how we're trapped in the matrix universe. And we're, we're in a death, death loop which is this infinity circle where we're just going to keep perpetuating it until we break out. Yeah, that was the thing again, about I her. Just, like, and this is all like new for her, wasn't it? Like that wasn't oh, her then, old, yeah. her old world was no. totally unlike all, all of that. When we interviewed her in, uh, it was uh, May of 2018, she had just found out about all of this the previous uh, January, February of 2017. Wow. So it had only been a year, and, and she, and, and if you're familiar with her, if you've heard of her name, since we started talking with her in the, 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 the fall of 2017 till today, she has blown up. She has become somebody that is helping people, and her sole mission is to help. She has gone to a lot of speaking engagements. She's on several different radio shows. She does some of her own podcasts, and she does meditations that help people you know, connect to their – her purpose is to help people. And it's all happened in a very, very short amount of time. And that's kind of the thing about this experience that you both uh, – you guys delineate in this film, which is – there's trauma, but there's also transformation, right? And so all of these individuals who have gone through this process of encounter with these other beings, they've they've come out of it different. And they, there's definitely a great depth to those, um, to the people that you've interviewed. All of them are deep. All of them are mm -hmm. very, very, very thoughtful about their experiences. So it's it's really interesting to listen to them all. So we've got about uh, less than 10 minutes before we uh, wrap this segment up. And I'm just wondering if there are any other really important themes that either of you feel we you would like to cover in the time that we have left here. Oh, there's there's quite a few. <laughs> uh, it, it's part of it is that, you know, it's uh, and I'll just go off first. And Jack, you can kind of chime in, too, because we we both have gone. We, we've been on. Uh, this journey together as, as partners and filmmakers in this, but we've also have had experiences, you know, through the interviews that we've done that have impacted us individually. 
But from a thematic point of view, I think, you know, the, the main essence of this film is, is, is threefold, is that one, we want to present stories in a way that somebody who may have never heard of uh, the hybridization program or might be familiar with abductions, but not much further than that. Uh, they, they, they have a better understanding of the type of people that are having these experiences and what these type of experiences are. So it's creating awareness is a big, important part of the, the, the film. The second part of it is the uh, compassion and, and understanding that just because you have an experience that doesn't mean somebody else has, has not. So just if, if you might not be able to relate, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. What you can offer then to people who have been through something profound, who have been affected in some serious way, is your, you know, a shoulder, uh, an ear, a, a hug, uh, you know, compassion and empathy towards an individual who has been through something profound that you might not quite understand, but you can still be there for them. You might not have had cancer before, but you can be there for a person who's had cancer. You might not have lost a member of your family, but you can be there for somebody who has lost a member of, your, of their family. So that, that, that whole idea of empathy and compassion is something we really wanted to, to come through in the film. And the third thing is uh, for the people who have had experiences that don't feel comfortable coming out and talking about it, that there is a community, a large community of people who are out there who have had experiences just like you, who if you reach out to and talk to uh, groups, you may find out that you're not alone and you may find out that you don't need to be uh, alone in your journey. And, and we really hope that that's one of the big things that happens with this film is that people realize that I'm not alone. I, I, I should reach out. I should tell my story. I should talk to people so that I can you know, find that brotherhood, sisterhood uh, of people that I can, I can connect with. So that's big important. Those were big important themes for me. Thanks. That's great. And those are some of the things that I recall when Melinda Leslie had her moments uh, talking about that she, uh, I thought, really hit home the point of having compassion and also the benefits of of looking for like minded people, like people have had these experiences to create a community. Because we really are, um, w- whether we're studying this or whether we're experiencing this, where those of us who are involved in this are out on the fringes of what is con- still even now considered respectable society. And it's tough. It does take a toll. So the community aspect, I think, is very, very important. And I think you do a good job of it. The other thing I just want to say about this film, if I may, is it's a nice looking film. Like it's just nicely shot. Uh, it, it, it flows very well. Uh, I found it actually a really enjoyable experience to just ex- to have the whole film unfold uh, before me. It really draws people into it. So I'm hopeful that you'll you'll get good response from it. And, and should we mention you're associated with The Orchard, right? Well, The Orchard uh, was recently uh, sold to 1091 Media. So we kind of look at it as The Orchard slash 1091 Media now. So this film is coming out as an Orchard film, but it was in the works before the the, the transition to the new company happened last month. So it's an Orchard film, but 1091 is the moving forward uh, company. Wonderful. And when when and where will this appear? Like how will people be able to find the movie? It uh, will uh, launch on digital, uh, digital platforms, uh, video on demand and digital downloads, a variety, you know, a dozen different platforms on September 3rd. Um, uh, we're also... Uh, submitted to several other film festivals, and we're hoping to hear some uh, more opportunities for the film to screen uh, in different cities before the launch of the film. All right, very good. I know your your website, uh, can I just uh, state it here? You're at j3films.com, and you have a Facebook page as well. Could you just tell people your Facebook page? Sure, it's uh, our facebook.com slash uh, EX2 The Seating. Uh, we do a lot of our updates through the, the Facebook page, uh, but we're on, uh, uh, we're on um, Instagram and Twitter as well. So we have J3 Films. Uh, we have uh, Extraordinary The Seating uh, is a separate uh, uh, account on, on Facebook. We also have Alt POV TV, which is another entity in and of itself uh, for content specific to alternative points of view. So we're, we're, we have a variety of different uh, channels that we're hoping to develop more and more content to push through those to help, uh, you know, provide that alternative point of view. 
I really believe in what you guys are doing here. And I think that Extraordinary the Seating is a, a very fine documentary on, on this subject. And I, I have to say I'm proud to have been part of it, to have played a small role in it. Well, gentlemen, I think that's about all we got the time for here. I've very much enjoyed chatting with you both, John Sumple and Jack Roth, two of the producers in J3 Films of Extraordinary the Seating, a really fine new documentary on alien abduction and the people who experience that. So can I get you on for another hour on the Richard Dolan members site where we can talk about a few of the very interesting cases you were not able to get into that film? Absolutely. Look Love forward to. to it. Sounds great. Well, that concludes this part of my interview with uh, John Sumpel and Jack Roth. And if you want to hear us continue this conversation, you can go to my website, richardolanmembers.com, where we are going to go even further. That's all we got this time. Thanks for listening. And remember, while we learn and grow and search for the truth, let's be good to each other. Later. <laughs>